We'll be back in Galatians chapter 5 if you'd like to turn there this morning. I know we finished the fruit of the Spirit last week. Over the last several weeks, I would begin by asking you about a different fruit. I'd ask, do you have love in your life? Do you have joy in your life? Peace and patience, goodness, meekness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We'd ask one by one, or one Sunday we asked three, but we'd ask one at a time, do you possess these fruit in your life? These things that should be manifested by God's Holy Spirit in your life. And so we spent several weeks there, and we finished looking at what is known as the fruit of the Spirit. But if you're in Galatians chapter 5, we've been reading verses 22 and 23, but notice the first word of verse 22. It says, but, but the fruit of the Spirit. Now, one thing that I always try to emphasize to people, and people say things about, you know, I don't know how to read the Bible, or, you know, one, one tip that I give people a good bit is if you see a verse that begins with the word and, or but, or because, or therefore, one of those words that's known as a conjunction, it's joining two things together. I always say, don't start with that verse, back up a little bit. Uh, so I know I've been guilty of doing that over the last few weeks. We've just been looking at the fruit of the Spirit. But verse 22 begins by saying, but the fruit of the Spirit. Paul is making a contrast. We've been looking at what the fruit of the Spirit is, but this morning I want us to back up all the way to verse 16 and then read through this passage and get it all in context. Because Paul is not just talking about the fruit of the Spirit, but some things that I believe he wants us to see as well. So would you join me following along in verse 16 of Galatians chapter 5. Paul says this. I know it begins with but again. But he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now here's our text this morning in verse 19. He says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, or manifested, or obvious, Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at things that should be in the life of every Christian. The fruit of the Spirit. You are saved, God has given you His Holy Spirit, and the Spirit will work with you to produce love in your life, and joy, and peace, and patience, and on down the list. And just as much as it is true that every Christian should have the fruit of the Spirit in their lives, so it is also true that every Christian should make sure that they do not have what Paul refers to here as the works of the flesh manifested in their lives. So the message this morning is simply titled that, The Works of the Flesh. We've been looking at the fruit of the Spirit that is supernatural. Nobody on their own, by birth, has all the things that we see in verses 22 and 23. You don't come by that in the natural person. That comes after salvation miraculously through God's Holy Spirit. But from birth, we have the works of the flesh evident, manifested, within each one of us. You might look at that list and say, hang on, that doesn't all describe me. Well, maybe not every one of them. But the natural person, every one of us that has flesh, which is every one of us, we all have the works of the flesh manifested within us from birth. It is our sin nature. It's what theologians refer to as the Adamic nature because we all come from Adam. And Paul would write to the church in Rome that in Adam, we all sin. Death has passed upon all of us, for all of us have sinned, every one of us that is a descendant of Adam and Eve. We all wear this flesh, and we all from birth have the works of the flesh within us. The only thing we can do about it is repent, put our faith in Jesus, allow him to fill us with the Holy Spirit, who will work with us to remove these works of the flesh, and in its place will cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. It is not natural. And I want to be clear, nobody gets saved by removing all the works of the flesh. You can't do that well enough. You can't do it on your own. But you give your life to Christ, you get saved, and He will begin to clean you up. He will begin to remove the filth of the flesh from you, and He will begin to produce the fruit of the Spirit 
within you. So don't make the mistake of thinking, well, if I want to go to heaven when I die, I've just got to quit drinking. If I want to go to heaven when I die, I've got to stop the sexual immorality. I've got to give up the idolatry. If I want to go to heaven, I've got to do better. No, if you want to go to heaven, you've got to put your faith in Jesus Christ. You want to go to heaven, you believe and you repent and you trust in him, and he will begin to remove these things. So many people have tried behavior modification. I'm going to get rid of the bad stuff and I'm going to be all right. It doesn't work that way. You can't do it well enough. But with God, you can do all things. So I'm going to divide this list into three groups that we're going to look at today. If you want to take notes, the first group we're going to look at pertains to righteousness. The first thing we see in verse 19, Paul mentions three words. And I know different translations will use different words, and that's okay. But in verse 19, he says, The works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. And so we're going to focus on these three words for the next few minutes. But these are things that directly relate to our righteousness. He begins by saying sexual immorality. The Greek word that he uses here is porneia. It's where obviously in English we get the word that ultimately becomes pornography for us. He says the first work of the flesh, the first thing that is natural and inborn from every one of us that wears flesh, the first thing that we see that we each are prone to from birth is porneia, immorality. What we would think of, first of all, is pornography. Now, it is not limited to just that. We might think of a dirty magazine. We might think of a website we shouldn't go to, and we say, that's what Paul's talking about. We got to go back in time and remember there were no magazines in his day. There were no websites in his day. Those were the things that we might have access to today. He didn't. And so while that may apply to us, it's not exactly what he had in mind. But let's think about where it applies to us today, to think about lustful images that we may put before us, or to even go seek out images that we, we may want to see. Paul says, these are the works of the flesh. This is not good. I think we know that. We probably don't have to be told, well, this isn't from the Spirit. This is part of the works of the flesh. Remember when, when Hugh Hefner died just a, a little while back? Remember Hugh Hefner, he's the, the founder of, of Playboy? He died a little while back, didn't he? Was it him? It was Hugh Hefner, wasn't it? Okay. Nobody, nobody nodded their head, literally nobody, and it made me almost panic. So Hugh Hefner died just, just a little while ago, and uh, you remember so many people were, they were acting like Billy Graham had died when Hugh Hefner died, right? I mean, it, it was amazing how people deified him. The same people when Billy Graham died, they acted like Hitler had died. It, wasn't that a strange thing? That just shows you the culture we live in. Hugh Hefner dies, the ultimate pornographer in the world. He dies, and, and people are acting like it's Billy Graham. And then Billy Graham dies, and people are like, oh, he's an idiot, he's a jerk, he's a bigot. It's like you just deified the man who started the entire pornography business in America. Uh, but, but people look to him like a hero. They look to him like he'd done a great thing. And I'll tell you, I would not want to stand before God on Judgment Day and be known for what he was known for, what he made an empire out of, what people have only tried to emulate his success by doing. And Paul uses this word, porneia, and it's where we get our word for pornography. It is not a good thing. We may try to justify it. We may try to say, oh, there's no victims here. I'm not, I'm not hurting anybody. And we might say, this is just me and my mind. It's not like I'm running around in my spouse. It just exists up here. But it is very dangerous. Paul kicks off his list with this because it is not reality. It warps people's minds. It begins to change your brain. It begins to change the way that you think. It begins to change the way that you interact with other humans. It is a dangerous thing. And it's no wonder Paul kicks off his list with that word porneia. The works of the flesh are evident, and he begins with that. Now, like I said, they didn't have Hugh Hefner back in those days. They didn't have that type of thing. So what could he have been referring to? Well, sexual immorality is, is a really a general term. In fact, if you're looking at a King James Bible, you don't see that word. You see the word adultery in its place. And so you might be looking at adultery and thinking, well, I'm not even married. I can't commit adultery, so I'm off the hook here on number one. Uh, but this is not a knock on the King James. It this was the proper word at the time, and newer translations go back to the original languages and update it in a little bit more modern-day English, whereas adultery to us today is limited to a husband and wife, but, but way back then, this was more of a general term for immorality. And, and so Paul is using a very broad term here that we might today make very specific. We might make it just about a husband and wife, or we might make it just about looking at a magazine or going to a website, and Paul is making it much broader than that. Whether you're married or unmarried, you can fall into this. 
whether it's something you're looking at, whether it's something in your mind, whether it's something you physically do, you may fall into this trap. Paul speaks about immorality. And I know it's not a fun topic for us this morning, but Paul begins his list with this word because it's very important and it's something that a lot of people can fall guilty, uh, can find themselves guilty of doing. And it may not be even as blatant as some of the things I've talked about today. It could be the places that your mind begins to wander when reading a romance novel or a soap opera or a sitcom. It could be where a movie or even a song takes you to another place. You know, some of these things are so dangerous for our minds because our minds work very funny. It's, it's amazing. We can't remember where we put the keys. We can't remember what we went out to Walmart for. But yet certain things can trigger your mind and take you back 50 years ago to something you shouldn't have been doing with people you shouldn't have been with. Isn't it weird how our minds work like that sometimes? And, and an old song that we used to sing in high school or, or something, you know, we used to sing this or play this. I was going to say CD, but, you know, back to high school for something that wasn't CDs. Whatever it was that you used to listen to back then, we can hear a song and it can take us back to those places. And it can maybe take you back to your first love or an old crush or an old flame. And you can begin to listen to that song and it starts off harmless and then you begin to let your mind wander back. What would life be like if I was still with that person instead of the one I'm with? And something that can start off so innocent or seem so harmless to us can, can have worlds of consequences. And Paul says that we must be on guard against porneia in any form, whatever that looks like. If it's through reading a book or watching a chick flick and it makes a woman say, boy, I wish my husband was more like that. You wonder the reality of that person in your book or your movie? There's a team of writers that spend hours on every word to make it perfectly what no real man would ever say. And yet you sit there thinking, boy, I wish my husband was more like that. Of course he's not. You didn't marry the soap opera star because that stuff is not reality. But it's just as dangerous for a man to look at an image and say, I wish my wife looked more like that. You know why she doesn't? Because that is just as fake. That's a person who literally starves herself to look a certain way or is photoshopped or airbrushed or enhanced, however they do it these days. But we look at things that are not real and we begin to wonder, what would life be like if I was with that person? That is fake. It's poison. It's not realistic. And Paul says, we must be on guard against porneia in any form. He mentions immorality. The next word we see here is impurity or uncleanness, depending on what version you're looking at. He says, we must not be unclean. I'm not a doctor, uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, first of all, I couldn't be. Uh, but secondly, I don't have the stomach for it. Uh, there, I think there's very few people that, that can look at open wounds or can see the side of blood or could perform surgeries. Uh, it, it takes a special person, in my opinion, because a lot of people would pass out at the sight of blood. Have you ever noticed that? I, I had a friend who was given blood a few years ago, saw the blood going up just into the little bag and passed out in the chair just, just from seeing blood. There's a lot of people like that. They, the, the police officer that sees his first homicide and he has to go and you know, throw up behind the corner. And so there's a lot of people whose stomachs just can't handle things like this, but lunch is not for you know, at least another half hour or so. So I'm going to say something that, that might be kind of nasty to you, but this word that Paul uses for unclean or impure, it is a medical term that refers to an oozing wound, to a sore on your skin that will not heal, and where things begin to seep out of it that you don't want to see or touch. It is a nasty term that Paul is using. He's saying the works of the flesh, what some of you guys are doing in your life, is like a nasty, infected, pus-filled, oozing wound on your body. Nice image, isn't it? But that is a word that we just, tra how do we translate this into English? Well, impure, unclean. And it might lose some of the punch that Paul was trying to give to it. It's a little bit nicer around lunchtime to think of it this way. But notice that is what Paul is doing to picture sin. He's referring to sin as something that's so nasty. You wouldn't want your friends to see. You had a wound like that, you want to cover it up. Pack it with gauze, you know, wear long sleeves, do whatever you can to keep it hidden. Nobody goes around flaunting an oozing wound. Hey, check this out. It's disgusting. And, and there's things in our life, there's sin in our lives that we would not want people to see. And we try to cover it up. We try to keep it concealed. We try to keep it as our little secret. He refers to, to being unclean or impure. Biblically speaking, there was two ways to be unclean. There was a moral uncleanness. And then there was likewise a ceremonial uncleanness. Under the old covenant, a person could be ceremonially 
unclean. It means you weren't allowed to come into the temple. You couldn't go in and worship. You couldn't bring your sacrifices. You couldn't make your offerings if you were unclean. A person could be unclean from any number of things. It could be anything as harmless as your parent passed away and you prepared their body because they didn't have funeral homes like we do today. You wrapped the body in spices. You wrapped them up. You had a wake. And because you came in contact with the dead body, you were ceremonially unclean. Certain types of illnesses or diseases, uh, certain types of innocent and even good things could leave a person unclean for a certain amount of time. And so nobody wanted to be unclean. No believer wanted to be unable to worship. So if you were unclean, even through, through good and, and moral things, left ceremonially unclean, there were things you could do to quicken the process to become clean again. But there was also a moral uncleanness. And this is where it might apply to us today. Because there is no ceremonially un, unclean, uncleanliness here today. You can walk in just as you are. But if there is a moral uncleanness in your life, if there is this sin, this immorality, this impurity, if it is in your life, now you can come here, you can lift up your hands when the music is played, you can throw a hundred dollar bill in the offering plate. But if you are morally unclean today, if you are harboring sin in your life today, you're not really worshiping God. You could be drawing attention to yourself, you could be checking your religious block, but you're not doing yourself one bit of good. Your prayers are not heard. Your acts of service to God are worthless. As he looked down through his prophet and he says that I despise your feast days. And everybody comes together and they sing and everybody's having a good time and praising me, but your hearts are far from me. You honor me with your lips, but I know that you're not living the right kind of life. You're like a tomb, Jesus says, whitewashed and beautiful on the outside, but inside is full of corpses, dead men's decaying bones. There's people that walk into church and they play the part and they look nice and they dress up and they do everything outward that they think they should do and inside they're harboring an uncleanness, like an oozing, festering wound that will not get better. You're not doing yourself one bit of good. Paul says this is the work of the flesh and it must not be evident in your life. And then the last thing as it relates to righteousness is sensuality. It goes hand in hand with porneia, but it takes it a step further. In verse 19, as uh, he concludes that list with that word. It refers to a lack of restraint. Primarily, it can be used in any number of ways, but it's primarily used in the Bible with sexual excess, without shame or care. As I said a minute ago, with porneia, a lot of people try to keep that compartmentalized, hidden in their mind, in the dark corners of their heart, hidden away in the shadows. This is my dirty little secret. Nobody knows it but me. As it relates to sensuality, this is the person that flaunts it, the person that seems proud of it. This is the Hugh Hefner type person. It's the person who, you know, attends parades and puts crude and vulgar things on, on signs and carries them around and tries to draw attention to normalizing their form of perversion. It's a person that sins out in the open. It's not hidden in the shadows. They do it in the light of day. This sensuality that Paul refers to. You say, well, which one is worse? Well, in God's eyes, sin is sin. Whether you keep it hidden in your heart or whether you flaunt it for all to see, both are wrong, both are bad, both are destructive. Now, we could say this, though. Jesus says that anybody that causes one of these little ones, one of these children to be led astray, it would be better that a millstone were tied to his neck and he were drowned in the sea than he would cause a child to sin. And if somebody looks up to the sin in your life, if somebody looks at you and says, well, I want to be just like you when I grow up, if somebody emulates your behavior, if somebody says, well, it can't be too bad if brother so-and-so from church is doing it, it can't be that bad if my Sunday school teacher is doing it, the show can't be that bad if she's watching it, the, the language can't be that bad if that's how he's talking, and somebody's looking up to you and learning sin from you, Jesus says there is a strong punishment reserved for those people. And so sin is sin in God's eyes, but if you are leading anybody astray, by sinful habits in your life, by sensuality, by a lack of restraint, sinning without shame or care of consequence. It is a very dangerous thing. He talks about the sins of righteousness. Number two, he talks about sins of religion. Only two words we're going to look at here in verse 20. In verse 20, he continues by saying idolatry and sorcery. We'll pause there. Idolatry and sorcery. Idolatry refers to worshiping any man made image or thing other than God. In his culture, in this immediate context, 
people had statues, people had carved images, people had things, whether they were icons, whether it was jewelry that they wore, people had images of their gods and they bowed down to them and they worshiped them, treated these images as if they were alive. He was talking to people that believed that Zeus was a real deity and if they had a picture of him in their home or a statue or a portrait or some type of image, they would pray and worship these idols. I, I don't know of anybody that bows down to idols today. Now, we might have some religious relics or icons. We might have a cross or something that we might maybe give it a little bit too much reverence. But by and large, we're not people that bow down to an idol, not to a man-made image. But we can certainly be guilty of idolatry. If we give our time and attention to anyone or anything besides God. The verse Alicia read from Revelation this morning. Jesus alone is worthy. The Lamb is worthy to receive glory and honor. Everything we can do, we crown Him with many crowns because He alone deserves it. But we look to other things. And I'm not, I'm not even talking about other gods, other religions, but just our hobbies, the things that we chase after. We make them number one in our life. I talked about this the other Wednesday night. For those mothers that make their children the gods of their life. When every decision is made based on the kids. Now I know many of them are dependent. They need you to make decisions for them. But when every choice in your life is about the kids. Well what do you do when the kids become grown ups? And you've neglected your marriage. You've neglected your own spiritual well being. You can't make the kids the god of your life. You can't make your spouse the god of your life. You can't make every decision based on your spouse or your job or what is profitable, what's going to be about your future, your hobbies and careers. Those things are all well and good, but they cannot be number one in our life. Jesus alone must be number one. Anything else is idolatry. And then he mentioned sorcery. The Greek word that he used there for sorcery is pharmakia. It's where we get our English word for pharmacy or pharmaceutical. It was a word that originally just referred to any type of medicine. But here it's translated into English as sorcery. How do we go from picking up your prescriptions at CVS to being guilty of sorcery? What happened is the people that were involved in witchcraft and, and anything that had to do with, with the demonic, the, the fortune telling, the psychic type things, they also at the same time were taking these mind altering drugs as part of their worship experience. And so they would take these pills or whatever form they found them in as part of how they would worship. And it was demonology, basically. It, it was more worshiping the devil than it was anything else. But because of the medicines that they would take that would alter their mind, our word for pharmacy is tied in with their word for sorcery. Now again, today, it's probably not the crowd that I'm talking to. People, you know, dabbling in, in, in sorcery. It's probably not Ouija boards and, and psychics for most people in here. And it's probably not the same drugs that he was talking about. But anything we do in our mind that alters it, anything we do to take ourselves away from the state that we should be in, that's why Peter said to be sober and to be vigilant because our adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion walking in and out of here from pew to pew and house to house looking for somebody to devour. We have to be of our right mind. We have to be sober. People say, oh, what's the big deal if I drink this? What's the big deal if I take that? These are just some, something that takes the edge off. It helps me relax. If you are not sober when you do it, it's a big deal. We must be on guard because the minute we alter our minds, our adversary kicks it up a notch. As a roaring lion, he has found that weak gazelle. When we do something to alter our mind, and it can be the pain pills that you are abusing. It can be the things that you know you should have stopped taking years ago, and you continue to get that prescription refilled. It could be a drink. It can be a substance. It can be something you put in your body to alter your mind. And all you are doing is weakening yourself, wandering from the herd, allowing that roaring lion to pick you off in your weakest moment. No, be sober, be vigilant. It is a big deal because when we do those things, it leads our minds away from God. And that's why it's lumped in here with the sins of religion. But then finally, we see the sins of relationships. What affects our relationships between each other? In verse 20, we read idolatry and sorcery, but it continues enmity, strife. We'll talk about what these words mean quickly, though. Jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like, or things like these. We're going to put these in groups together. He begins with enmity and strife. Enmity refers to hateful attitudes. You ever know somebody with a hateful attitude? 
not fun to be around. The person that walks in a room, everybody's laughing, having a good time, and then somebody walks in, you're like, oh. You just kind of feel like a collective sigh kind of through the whole room. Just kind of lets the air out of the room. Somebody comes in with a hateful attitude. Everything's always wrong. Always have a problem with somebody. Always upset about the way things are going. They're always saying things like, you know what they should be doing, and they can mean anybody. You know what they ought to be doing. You know what they should do. You know what so-and-so has been up to. They walk in a room with that hateful attitude, that enmity, and it leads to strife. Enmity and strife go hand in hand. It leads to bitter conflict. If you harbor a hateful attitude, it results in bitter conflict. You're always angry, always upset with somebody, and you'll find that it damages your relationships with the people you're mad at, with the people you alienate yourself from because nobody wants to be around you with that attitude, and it leads to bitter conflict to where you find yourself starting to lose your friends, losing your marriage, You find yourself in a situation where you look around and you're like, where'd all my friends go? You burned all your friends because of your hateful attitude, enmity, and strife. These are the works of the flesh. Next he mentions jealousy and anger. Jealousy, like enmity, it's resentment towards others. You look around at other people, instead of celebrating their success, you think, well, how how come that doesn't happen to me? When am I going to get my turn? Oh, they got a promotion? Yeah, good for them. I deserve a promotion. Oh, yeah, they, they bought a new boat. Yeah, fantastic. When am I going to get to buy a boat? Oh, you see them on Facebook. Oh, they're, they're out at a nice restaurant. Well, yeah, well, guess who had PB&Js today? And instead of being happy for somebody, everything makes you jealous. You want what they have. And when that happens, we are not grateful for the things that we've been given. And we know that every good gift comes down from above. Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches might not be your favorite, but they are a blessing from God because they can nourish your body. They can satisfy your hunger. They can give you strength to live another day, but you look at that as a curse. When am I going to get to go out for steak? No, God has not let you starve to death today, has he? He's provided not manna from heaven, but peanut butter and jelly, or ramen noodles, or whatever it is that you're eating, and you might view it as, when am I going to get my turn? You ought to be thankful. Instead of being grateful that God has provided yet another meal, you're jealous of what you don't have. Instead of keeping up with the Joneses, we should be grateful for what God has given us. If we are jealous, it only leads, like strife, it leads to anger. To bitter conflicts, it leads to unprovoked outbursts, or as it says here, fits of anger. You can only be jealous for so long before you blow it, before you blow your top, so to speak, before you have an outburst of anger, before you finally find yourself yelling at that person who did nothing wrong, except go out for a nice dinner and then make the mistake of posting it on Facebook and you saw it. And then you find yourself losing your temper, yelling at that person in fits of rage, doing nothing more than burning yet another friendship. He mentions next disputes, dissensions, factions, and envy. These four words together refer to animosity over festering issues. It's the same thing. You're harboring bitterness, you're harboring jealousy, anger, enmity, And it, like a festering problem, it won't go away. It's like trying to sweep something under the rug instead of addressing it. I had a a friend called me a couple years ago, and he said, hey, we need to talk. And he he came and he picked me up. I got in his car, and he said, two or three days ago, he said, you said this. You you made this comment, and he told me whatever I'd said. He he said, what did you mean by that? And I explained it, and he said, said, that's a relief. He said, you want to know how I took that comment? And he told me, so when I heard you say that, this is what I thought you meant. I thought you were t- making a little jab at me. I thought you were making a dig at me. I said, no, 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 that's not at all what I meant. And he said, I'm so glad to hear that. Hope you have a good day. Thanks for your time. But you know, but what would have happened if instead of getting right to it, confronting me with that, going to me one-on-one, what if instead he would have let that fester and harbor that? What if instead he would have held on to that and been angry? Every time he saw me, he would have thought, that jerk, there's that guy again. I can't stand that guy. He thinks he's better than me. And our friendship would have been fractured. And we make the mistake sometimes of just hanging on to that anger instead of going to a person one-on-one, which is what Jesus said to do in Matthew chapter 18 anyway. If your brother has sinned against you, you go to that person one-on-one, and if he hears you, you have regained your brother. Problem solved. But we don't like to go to people one-on-one. We'd rather post a vague Facebook status about it. We'd rather talk about them behind their back. Can you believe what that person said about me? I thought we were friends. 
It's not a one-on-one. We go to everybody but that one. And we allow these issues to fester. And guess what we do? We affect more relationships. We lose more friends. We've got to go right to a person. Don't sweep it under the rug, but make it right. And then he mentions drunkenness and carousing. Drunkenness, we understand. But instead of just the occasional, I had a few too many last night, it's a word that really implies somebody who habitually gets drunk for any reason. Not because it was St. Patrick's Day, hope that wasn't you. Not because it was the weekend, not because I'm trying to drown my sorrows because I had a bad day, but people that don't even need an excuse. Why, what are you drinking so much for? I don't know, it's Tuesday. You know, people that they don't even need a reason to get drunk, just always drinking, always trying to find any reason to not be sober, to not be in your right mind, and then carousing, or you know, yours might have any number of synonyms. It just refers to crude behavior in general, but specifically crude behavior that's done in the daylight. As most people wait for nightfall to sin, most people like to sin in private, but carousing refers to, I don't care who sees me, I don't care who knows me. It's that flaunting your sin type of thing. And then he ends verse 21 by saying, and the like, or and other things like these. Meaning this list is not comprehensive. It means we can add a lot of other things to this list if we wanted to. So you might look at that and say, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And Paul says, yeah, but there's more like this. He's saying, you get the idea. There's plenty more works of the flesh, plenty more sinful things that we can be guilty of doing. Now, what do we know about this as well? The verse ends by saying, we know, I've warned you before, I will warn you again that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Of course, the kingdom of God means heaven. So you want to go to heaven? If you are practicing porneia, uncleanness, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, or not being sober, or your relationships, you're full of enmity, your jealousy, strife, fits of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, and carousing. Oh, you want to go to heaven when you die? But this is your life? He's saying, I've already warned you before. I'll tell you again, you're not going to heaven if you practice these things. What does the word practice mean? It is a present tense an ongoing action. It means this is what you do day in and day out. This is how you live your life. Christian, if you're sitting here listening to these things and thinking, oh my goodness, last week I slipped up and I I did this. That's not what he's talking about. You don't practice this. You made a mistake. You slipped up. That means that you're still human. You're a new creature in Christ with that same flesh that you've always had. And we're going to make mistakes. So don't think, oh man, if I messed up last week, I must not be saved. It's not what it means. But do you live in this? Do you practice this? Is this who you are? Is this what you do? Or do you turn to the next verse and see love and joy and peace and patience? Do you live by the works of the flesh or do you live by the fruit of the Spirit? You are one or the other. That's how it works. Paul has drawn a line in the sand and says every human being on the planet is in one of two categories. It is either the works of the flesh for you or it's the fruit of the Spirit for you. So where do you find yourself? As I said at the beginning, if you, if you know, man, I, I'm guilty of all this. This is how I live. This is who I am. I can't make it to heaven. No, you can't. And if you rightly recognize that, now you're in a place where you can be saved. You're in a place where you can get right. Do not make the mistake of thinking, okay, if I join AA, if I do the 12 steps, if I, that's not how you do it. You call out to Jesus. You make him the Lord of your life. You let his Holy Spirit enter you, and the fruit of the Spirit will begin to take care of itself. Cleaning up the works of the flesh will begin to take care of itself. Now, you've got to work hand in hand with God's Spirit to do those things, but not until you're saved. It is a futile endeavor. You will never clean up your life. You will never save yourself, but you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. If you realize right now that there are some things in your life that need to change, change them. Because while a Christian can slip up in sin and that not be what they practice, it's also possible that a Christian can find themselves backslidden or like a prodigal son. Maybe you found yourself recently, in the last few weeks, doing one of these same things over and over. You know you're a Christian, you know you're trusting in Jesus, but yet you found yourself kind of stuck in a habit that you can't quite get out of. Repent. 
You're saved, you're going to heaven, but yeah, but repent. Remove it. Get rid of it because you know it should not be there. And maybe God's brought you here today to hear this. That thing in your life that you know shouldn't be there, remove it today. I'm going to ask you to please stand right where you are. We're going to have a time of response where if you know there's a change that needs to be made in your life, this is an opportunity for you to make it. Christian, you know there's a habit that shouldn't be there. Get rid of it. Repent. Call out to the Lord. He'll help you with it. You realize the fruit of the Spirit is lacking in your life. Ask God to help you. But maybe you're not a Christian at all. You realize today that you practice the works of the flesh. Your life is characterized by uncleanness and immorality and bad relationships and bad religion. And you know that's what you practice and you need to be saved. Come forward today. We'll pray with you. We'll show you how you can know that you're saved. Or call out to Jesus right where you stand. He'll save you. Lord, I pray in these next few minutes that there's anybody here that needs to make something, some kind of choice or decision to be right with you, let them do it. God, I pray that even now somebody would step out and walk down here to get saved or to repent of some sin and be right with you. And I ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As the song says, you come if the Lord has laid it on your heart.